We are studying the work of Perkei Avos, the teachings of our sages, and we're in the 48 Ways to Wisdom, way number 35. A way to achieve wisdom is to be misrachik, is to distance oneself, to run away, to flee from kavod, from honor. It is a value, it is an ideal, it is a principle to try to not only not seek honor, not actively seek honor, but to actually run away from it, to flee from it, to distance oneself from it. And if you want Torah, you want divine wisdom, there's something antithetical to pursuing honor. These two goals don't go together well. You want honor, well, by definition, you're going to have to forfeit some Torah. And thus, if we want Torah, if we want to achieve divine wisdom, if we want to deepen our connection with the Almighty and His Torah, one of the things we need to do is to flee from honor, to distance ourselves from honor. In the Talmud, the Talmud cites, the Talmud records, the Talmud chronicles a list of prayers that the sages of the Talmudic era, that they would say. And it's interesting because a lot of these prayers were actually incorporated into the modern siddur, into the modern liturgy. And one of the prayers that we actually say at the end of our Amidah, one of the prayers is as follows. The great sage would say, My God, Nitzar l'shoni meira, guard my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking deceit. And when those cur- those people who curse me, let my soul be silent. V'nafshi ka'afar l'kol tihia. One of the great sages would pray that their soul would be like dust to everyone. I should be so insignificant in the eyes of others, I should be like dust that you trample upon, that you don't even notice. And then he would say, open up my heart in your Torah. And the commentaries tell us that what he's in effect saying is that because I will render myself like dust, because I will not be viewed as significant in the eyes of others, I'll be completely insignificant in the eyes of others, that will grant me the ability to have my my heart open for Torah. When your heart's like dust to all, when you're completely insignificant in the eyes of others, you are primed to be a receptacle for the Almighty's Torah. You want to get Torah? You want to acquire it? You flee from honor. Now, this is a hard one for us to swallow. And it's particularly hard, as we shall see, for someone who is engaging in Torah. When you're engaging in Torah, you're engaging in the most productive activity In existence, there's nothing you could do to elevate yourself, to make yourself worthy of distinction and stature. There's nothing that rivals, that equals Torah. So you're doing something that really is transforming you. It's changing you from a beast to an angel. It's elevating you. It's upgrading you. It's transforming you. And that should naturally lend itself to you saying, well, I've been elevated. I've been transformed. I've been upgraded. And therefore, well, people should view me as such. So it's particularly tricky because when you are studying, you are being upgraded. But if it gets to your head and you start wanting honor, and you start being happy with honor, you develop a taste for it, that is going to put a ceiling. That's going to limit how much you can actually immerse yourself in the Almighty's Torah. So this is the idea of, of way number 35, an aversion to honor, to to pursuing the the glory in the eyes of others, that is a way to acquire Torah. And I want to discuss it kind of starting from the ground level. Why would someone run away from honor? Isn't honor, prestige, status, stature, aren't these good things? Why would the Torah encourage us, would the Mishnah encourage us to distance ourselves from these things. So, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't pursue honor. That's a bit undignified. To actually say, oh, give me honor and look up to me and give me these important titles and stand up for me and listen very carefully when I speak. That's not becoming. It's unbecoming of us. But to flee from it, 
to run away from it, to deliberately seek to not have it, why is that appropriate? And, you know, I'll, I'll argue that, well, what if we're truly deserving? What if we are special? What if we do tower above our fellow man? Well, in that case, honor should be appropriate. And yet we're told to run away from it, to distance ourselves from it. When we study it and we see what our sages tell us, we discover that honor, when a person receives honor, they are viewed in high regard by other people. It could be very damaging. For one, it gets to a person's head. They start believing it. And they start playing to the crowd. When someone is trying to grow, trying to develop, trying to upgrade, trying to change themselves, trying to become more refined, trying to become more god godlike, to become more like an angel, that is a process of growth. And it's a process that really should never stop. Because even Moshe, the last day of his life, was trying to improve. So our mindset, the optimal mindset, is one of not, of, of, of not celebrating per se, or maybe celebrating a little bit, but to not dwell too much on where we are now because we still want to achieve something else later on, tomorrow, the day after. So if we start to say, well, I deserve honor because look, look at all I've done, that can lead to complacency. It's like the great athlete, right? The great athlete wants to get a big contract. And the big mistake that the teams make is they give them the contract based upon past performance for the other team. And a, a, a smart organization will say, well, I don't care what you did for the other team. I want to pay you what you're going to give me in the ensuing years and seasons. Honor is, is, is crediting where you are right now and what you've done. And that's great. But the more you celebrate that, the more you're fixing that in place. And the fact that you can grow even more and you could transform even more and you could elevate even more in your precious moments that you have over here. We don't know how long we'll last. We don't have any life expectancy. Our life expectancy is zero. We don't know how much life the Almighty will give us yet on this planet. We don't know how much more opportunity we'll actually have. But we are encouraged, and we're best advised, to always be in the mindset of, I have room to grow, I have room to improve. And honor distorts this whole process. Honor says, what I've done till now is worthy of distinction. And that's going to destroy our ability, or that's going to harm, hamper our ability to say, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect quite yet, I have room to grow. In addition, honor transitions our self-perception from an internal view to an external view. Honor feels good. Other people, they value me. They think I'm important. They look up to me. They respect me. They consider what I say to be important. That gets to your head. And you start to think about, well, I want to make sure that that continues. And you start to care about what other people think. And our job in, in life is to make sure that we are in conformity with what God wants. Honor is quite intoxicating. And once you have a little taste of it, you don't want to lose it. And you begin to optimize for that. And that becomes the barometer of success. They say that what uh, what gets measured gets managed. If you if you're seeking, this is like management theory. You have to find out how you want to decide to 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 measure what determines someone's success or failure. If honor becomes a little measure, a little metric in our in our life. And we're not running away from it. We're not avoiding it. We're going to stop playing towards that. And that will be very damaging. And this is particularly difficult 
for people who are spiritual, when someone gives you honor, it may, it may feel good. You have respect. They look up to you. You're important. It feels good. But it, it's different than other things that feel good, other experiences that feel good. Because it's not, it's not tangible. It's not physical. It's not material. But it's powerful. It's like a spiritual experience. And therefore, those who are spiritually focused are more, are more susceptible to it because they're, they're training themselves in their immersion in spirituality to become more attuned to the spirit. So they're much more susceptible to get caught into this web of, of seeking honor. The Talmud tells us, whoever is greater than his fellow has a greater Yetzirah. So you become greater, and that little nemesis that you have grows commensurately with you. And my grandfather, blessed memory, used to say that what this means is, is that the eight Sahara, it starts off life, and it says, what are you interested? You're interested, oh, you want to eat, you want to have candy. So it wants candy. As you get older and as you mature, it matures with you. And what happens when you become very spiritual? When the physical world, the physical domain does not quite have the same vise upon you that it had in the past. And you become interested in pursuing spiritual goals. It does the same. When someone is no longer titulated by the physical pleasures that the Yetzirah could afford to a person, they become more spiritual. The Yitzhak are transition to saying, okay, let's pursue counterfeit spiritual agendas. So you become spiritual, the Yitzhak becomes spiritual alongside you. You've grown, it's grown. And now, you don't want the petty things, you don't want the physical things, you don't want the material things, you want the spiritual things. You want honor. And as a result... The commentaries tell us that because you, because, because honor is a spiritual pleasure, it's a spiritual experience, it can more quickly exhaust the spiritual reward for righteousness and for mitzvahs. You do a mitzvah, we believe. Every single mitzvah person does. They become worthy. They become a bearer of the right to spiritual pleasure in the spiritual world. But if they receive their reward here, then they can exhaust, or they can at least lose out on a portion of their reward there. And because honor is a spiritual reward, it can drastically deduct the spiritual reward that's intended for the performance of mitzvahs. And therefore, honor is it's not only damaging, it's a bad bargain. Because it's cashing in a bit early on the righteousness and the good deeds and the mitzvahs and the Torah study that you've done over here. You're cashing in with petty honor from people that don't even care about you, don't you don't care about them, whose opinions don't ultimately matter. And you could be losing, you could be forfeiting all in the bank. Moreover, the Baal Shem Tov is quoted as saying that when you receive honor in this world, people are lauding you. They're praising you. Right away in heaven, there's an assessment. Is this true? Is this not true? Oh, they're saying he's so righteous? Is he really? Is he really so righteous? Honor invokes heavenly judgment and scrutiny. And if a person is receiving honor for something that they're actually not worthy of, they're in big trouble. So we don't want a spotlight. We don't want a a heavenly audit. And when someone receives honor, they're in effect getting an audit from the heavenly IRS. No one wants that. And you know what? 
if the honor is undeserved, they're in big, big trouble. These are some of the reasons why the pursuit of honor and even the non-pursuit of honor is so dangerous, and that's why our sages are advising us to flee from it. And there's another wrinkle over here. You know, if you're if you're interested in a physical experience, there is an upper limit of how much you can you can absorb. You're really hungry. You want to go get lots and lots of food. So you go and you go to the all you can eat and you eat for an hour and a half. And then you feel full and you feel bloated and you feel awful. But you're you're done. You don't want to look at another bit of food for some time. There, there, there's a certain there's a certain maximum amount of physical experiences that you can tolerate before you get full, before you're satiated. Because honor, it's a it's a spiritual pleasure. There's no limit, the commentaries tell us. Because there's no physicality to it, there's no capacity of satiation to it, and therefore it's unlimited. And therefore, if you become someone who is interested in these sorts of experiences, you're in trouble because you have a little bit, you want more, and you're never really satiated because there's no way to get satiated with this. And the commentaries also tell us that unlike un- other desires, it does not wane with age. When you're old and you're wrinkly, and maybe the things that you were chasing as a youth, they don't excite you as much. But your standing, your prestige, your place in society, the honor that you think you are deserving of, that not only does not wane, it increases. And again, we're, we're, we're extra susceptible to this if we are in the group of people who are pursuing spiritual agendas. And the Masil Sisharim, Ramchal, he goes through some of the giants of our history who were derailed because of their pursuit of honor. He cites Jeroboam, Yerav Menavat. He was the one who, who did the split, right? There was the, the kingdom of, of, of David and Solomon. After Solomon dies, there's a split. The northern tribes secede from the southern tribes and uh, they kind of descend into the quagmire of sin. And the first one who instigated that rebellion was Jeroboam. He became the king of Israel. And Isaiah tells us that he was righteous and he was a scholar on par with the greatest scholars in the world. And he was told by God that he can have a stature akin to that of David. David was universally revered. He was the, the king of Israel. David Melech Yisrael. And God tells Jeroboam, if you just repent and you restore the unity of the nation and you eliminate idolatry, you're going to be on the level of David and in the words of the Talmud, you and me, God, and the son of Jesse and David, we will stroll together in paradise. That was the offer that God extended to Jeroboam. It's not too late to undo this. You can restore the union. You have to swallow your pride and eat your hat. But I'm guaranteeing you a level of experience in the afterlife, in paradise, forever, on the level of, of David. And Jeroboam rejected the offer. And the northern, the northern kingdom, it existed for a few hundred years until it was destroyed by the Assyrians, by Sancheriv, and the 
the tribes that survived, they were sent in all different directions, and they're lost, the ten lost tribes. And all that could be pinned on Jeroboam. And he was given at the very at the very beginning, he was given the out. He could have rejoined God's good graces and could have been strolling in paradise together with God and David. But he rejected it. Why? Because he asked God, if we're going to stroll together in paradise, and it'll be it'll be you, me, and David, who's going to be first? Is it, will, will David be like one step ahead of me? Or will I be first? So God says, no, no, David, David, he's a step ahead of you. If so, I'm not interested. So this, this incredible person, Jeroboam, who could have been on the level of David, maybe, maybe one notch below David, who could have saved the ten, the ten tribes, the ten northern tribes from devastation and calamity. All that was lost because he would be a half a step behind David. That is how dangerous and damaging it is for honor to be a primary factor in a person's decision-making. Similarly, Korach. Korach was a pikeach. He was a wise man. Literally wise. He was a sage that a lot of people thought he was on the same level as Moshe and Aaron. But why was he destroyed? Him and his whole camp. Because he wanted honor. Honor is very, very dangerous. And again, if we're simpletons, we're simple folks, just trying to get through life, it's not going to have such a strong effect on us. Because it's a spiritual thing. A lot of people could live happy lives without this being really a problem. But if we become more spiritual, honor is going to to start playing a very big factor in our lives. And it's dangerous, and we have to run away from it. And it's seductive, and it causes all sorts of problems. We must flee. And there's something deep about, about honor that makes it incompatible with the pursuit of the Almighty's Torah. When someone says, well, I'm deserving of honor. I am deserving of respect. You should look up to me. You should admire me. That is, in effect, them saying. That's an implicit statement that you did something and therefore you deserve reward. You deserve honor. You deserve accolades. A believer knows that everything they have is a gift from God. Everything. Oh, you studied? Well, where do you get your brains from? Oh, you did something kind? Okay, where do you get that from? You were charitable? Where did that come from? A believer realizes that every single thing is created by God and ultimately is God's. So yes, God gives us reward for our righteousness and for our kindness and for our charity and for our good decisions, our free will. But to say that I deserve honor, that means that I'm a creator of sorts. A creature, a creation, cannot really, logically, be worthy of any honor. So, the commentary is elaborate at this point that the pursuit of honor, it's almost incompatible with faith. And that's why it's not just enough to not, not seek it, but a, a real believer will try to run away from it. In the words of Ramchal, E. F. Shar, it's not possible for a person to be a committed servant of his creator when he cares, when he notices his own honor. These don't go together. You want your own honor? By definition, you are detracting from your commitment, your submission to God. And then he continues, Ramchal says, if a person did not need honor, if honor was not a factor in their lives, you'd be happy eating whatever you can eat. 
and wear whatever, whatever, whatever garments you have, as long as they cover you. And live in a house as long as you don't have rain falling on your head. And life will be easy. You don't need to have the fanciest car. You don't need to have the fanciest home. And you won't have to work so hard to, to, to pay for all this. And you'll be able to be a more, a more spiritually oriented person. But because nobody wants to see themselves as lower, as less than their neighbors, than their friends, they end up spending their life here just to keep up with the Joneses just to be on par with society, be upper middle class, right? But they end up missing out or they, they risk on missing out of what life's really all about. And he talks about someone who doesn't want to accept a job because it's beneath their dignity. He talks about people who I'd rather be on the public dole Take a job that's 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 beneath beneath my dignity. I have a degree. I went to university. I am a scientist. I have a PhD. It's beneath my dignity to work on this on this job. And he has a whole essay on this where he says, so people will end up not working. Because how can I work on this job? And then they end up stealing. And they end up behaving Inappropriately, because that's what happens when you're bored. Your honor and your unwillingness to take something which you view as being not up to your standards, that can cause your entire life to be derailed. And besides the Talmud, it's better to be a butcher carving up animals in a marketplace and not say, wow, I'm such an important person. How can I behave in this fashion? So I said in the Talmud, a person should always do work, even if it's foreign to you. And don't make yourself dependent on the public. And we see all sorts of human interactions that are tinged with this. I once had someone that I was, you know, someone came to the neighborhood. I didn't even know who they were. And uh, I went over to say hi to them and just to welcome them. I thought it was a nice thing to do. Try to do that when someone comes to the neighborhood. And they were so like dismissive of me. It was, it was, I thought it was a little bit inappropriate. Okay. Not judging them. Later on, I discover this guy is very rich. And he only deals with the you know, hoity-toity crowd, you know, high society. And I was thinking that this is this is the difference between Abraham and Bilam. Abraham, everyone that co- that came to him, he gave him so much honor. How did he treat the three weary travelers, angels? We discover, but they were masquerading as as people who were just traveling in a caravan. What honor he accorded them. What respect he gave them. Let me wash your feet. Come, let me take care of you. They're not important people. Abraham's the most important person in the world. He's a celebrity. And he bows before him and he runs and he tells God, wait, I got to tend to these people. And Bilam, when they come to him with this whole delegation to come curse the Jewish people, says, no, 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 I can't do it. You have to send an even more important delegation. I don't want the undersecretary of state. Send me the secretary of state. So I, I, I have, whenever I think of that person, I think that he's kind of like Billam. Billam, which is the greatest villain. And again, he, he would be horrified to hear that. But our sages do tell us that Abraham and Billam are opposites. And we should be a student of Abraham and not a student of Billam. And one of this is, is that we don't say, oh, you're not important enough for me to talk to you. You're not important enough for me to consider you. I only speak to the most important people. Oh, the people that are very intelligent, people that are, that, that are very successful, people that are important. People that matter. That is the mark of Bilaam. And we're told, don't be a student of Bilaam. Instead, be a student of, of Abraham. So, Ramchal's talking about the poor people. 
you're impoverished, you're unemployed, and you're not willing to do a job. You're not willing to do a job that will pay you a living so you can feed your family. Why? It's beneath you. It applies to rich people as well. Successful people, they look at other people and say, no, sorry, you're not up to snuff. You're not someone that I'm going to associate with. Now, we think of of honor, a pursuit of honor, as being a bad character. Certainly now, after we've learned more about it, it's not, a, it's not an ideal character. The Rambam tells us that when we must repent from, from our misdeeds, it's not only the sins that have an action with them that we have to repent for. A person must repent from the sins that have no action. The sins that are in our head. The sins that there's, there's no physical manifestation of what we did wrong. We were angry. We have to repent for it. We have to improve. We have to cleanse ourselves from that. We had some hatred or envy. We must repent from that. We were a bit frivolous. We have to repent from that. We're not serious. How can that be serious in life? We pursued honor. We have to repent for that. The Ram tells us, again, the laws of repentance. Chapter 7, law number 3. Pursuing honor is something which is not only bad, it's a bad idea, and it conflicts with our agenda of growth, and it does not seem to be compatible with our faith, and will necessarily detract from our faith, and is damaging in all sorts of ways. We must repent from it. That's how much we have to have an aversion to honor. Now, what do you do if notwithstanding your attempts to distance yourself from honor, people nevertheless heap honor upon you? So the commentaries tell us, you have to affix in your heart that really you're not deserving of all of this. And you shouldn't be moved at all by the honor that you receive, even a hair's breadth. It doesn't move the needle at all. Ezeu chacham halo made me call Adam. Who's the wise person? He who learns from everyone. Who does it mean everyone? It means even people that are on the socioeconomic, spiritual level, societal level, are lower than you. Learn from them. That's the mark of a true Wise person. A wise person, someone doesn't say, well, I'm important and you're not, and therefore you're not someone that I study from. And this is a portal to wisdom. You want wisdom? Do you actually want it? Our sages, they organized for us, they codified for us 48 different ways, different portals to wisdom. And they're telling us that if you flee from honor, you will be a better candidate to to be worthy of God's wisdom. We understand why. Fleeing from honor is an act, it's a tacit act of acknowledging God's dominion. You're saying, Hashem created everything, He owns everything, I'm fortunate enough to do, I'm privileged to do what He wants, I'm committed to Him, And God sees that and says, okay, I'm going to endow you with more of my Torah. The Torah is not in the heavens, but the keys to the Torah are in the heavens. And when the Almighty sees someone who acknowledges, who exhibits with their behavior, this acceptance of the Almighty's complete dominion, they become worthy of Torah. Moreover, if some if you're an important, important person, you have to go to functions. You have to be engaged as a leader in society. You're an important person after all. So you have all these obligations that come with honor. Honor has some price tags. Anonymity does wonders to the pursuit 
of Torah greatness. When a person says, I'm not important, I'm just a regular person. I don't need to be accorded honor. Someone like that has the time, has the headspace, and is positioned with the right outlook, with the right mindset to indeed be a worthy receptacle of the Almighty's Torah. Of course, you get a taste of it. It's very seductive. And this is an example of the subtlety, of the sensitivity that our sages are trying to convey to us. When we, when we see someone who has honor or receives honor, we don't view that as, as being a bad thing. <sighs> They're deserving. <laughs> Look how important they are. Look how intelligent they are. Look how special they are. It doesn't seem to be a problem for us. Our sages are revealing to us that there's a, this higher level of living where there's such a, a, a fine sensitivity to even the slight nuances in our spiritual domain and realm. They're advising us. This is what they do, and this is what we ought to do if we're serious about this. Distancing oneself from honor. That is way number 35 to achieve divine wisdom. Torah wisdom, the wisdom of the Almighty, which, of course, is all that we truly covet. My email address is rabbiwobajim.com. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback.